everyone. Welcome to the show. I am so excited today to talk to a good friend of mine, someone that I've met, uh, I think, last year down in Madison uh, in the startup scene, uh, Sarah uh, Ginky. Um, Sarah, welcome to the show. Hey, Andrew. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. Today we're talking about um, a really cool subject, one that when we met, we um, like just had a good time chatting about at whatever event it was. Um, so I'm like, we have to collaborate at some point on this. Um, and the topic is uh, using mentorship uh, to help with succession planning. A lot of businesses are um, needing to plan for the future, uh, plan you know, to transition the incoming workforce and, and transition the exiting workforce successfully. Uh, and so they're trying to find different ways of doing this. And one of the ways, probably one of the most powerful ways is through mentorship. Um, so before we get into that, though, Sarah, can you just uh, give everyone kind of a little background on who you are um, and, you know, uh, why, why you love talking about succession planning? <laughs> sure. Yeah. So um, actually, uh, I remember we met at Forward Fest um, and we just started talking kind of about mentorship and culture and all of that. Um, my background is in intergenerational workplace communication. I did some research during my undergrad and it's kind of led me on this path of discovering culture and wanting to get more involved in organizations, more so working on the organization while working in the organization. So I'm really excited to talk about this micro mentorship today. So before we get into like the details about micro mentorship and all this, let's just talk about what the problem is. Um, so the, the problem really is um, that we have a wide um, spectrum of people in the workforce today, right? Like five generations of, of people in the workplace. Um, and 60% of the workforce is up for retirement over the next 10 years. At least that's like a very general stat that's thrown out there. So all these businesses have to worry or not worry, but plan and, uh, you know, on this transition period. And they're thinking about a lot of things, but probably the most um, top of mind thing, at least from what I've heard, is they feel like the exiting workforce has all this integral knowledge about the organization, um, you know, tribal knowledge, uh, technical knowledge, whatever it is that they're walking away with. Um, and so that's a huge part of this succession planning piece. Um, and so uh, basically, you know, they, they need a way of uh, capturing the knowledge and bringing it to the incoming workforce. So right now, we, we, like you said, we have five generations in the workforce. So that's traditionalists. We have baby boomers. We have Gen X, Gen um, Y, aka millennials, and now Gen Z. Believe it or not, they are they're sneaking right on in there and nobody's really even paying too much attention about it. Um, but to kind of speak about the why this is a problem, you know, more than 60% of employers have expressed that they've experienced tension between employees from different generations. So just to kind of give you a little more background, why people are experiencing this tension between the generations is because we measure generations by pop culture and history. Um, and with such a large breadth spread of time, there's so many different things in human history that have changed and impacted the way that we view the world. And so essentially, we're just seeing the world very differently. However, it's very intricately involved. It's uh, a linear story of how our world has come to be. And so the tension really is that we think um, we're more different than we are similar. When in reality, we really are those byproducts of previous generations' choices. So um, yes, there are differences, uh, but I think that we can really break through those stereotypes by connecting with someone by using empathy or through empathy, um, so essentially through mentorship. So let's talk about why. Like, Why is it important um, to obviously capture the knowledge that the business depends on or the organization depends on um, you know, like what, what value are they at risk of losing, right? Yeah, that's um, a really, a really good pointed question. So um, 
in general, some of these um, elders, which we call um, some of the traditionalists, perhaps those baby boomers of, as they age, you know, they have a lot of history and knowledge on organizations and how um, things used to be and they've been there through the transition. So essentially, when someone moves to another company, retires, or unfortunately passes away, that information, that um, history on the organization, how to do things, leaves with them. And so the ability to capture that knowledge and pass it along from generation to a generation is essential for the growth and ultimately the longevity of the organization. How, how does this kind of plug into um, like succession planning? So I always love to assume that people don't know what they don't know. So I'm going to go ahead and define what succession planning is. Um, so really, that's a process for identifying and developing new leaders who can replace previous leaders. So it's a natural flow of, you know, replacement of leaders throughout time within an organization. So um, I think what succession planning really helps organizations with is being um, proactive rather than, rather than reactive. Someone leaves or someone passes away or they retire and you're kind of caught with your pants down. You don't know who's going to replace them. You're not really sure what those um, next steps are for your organization. So in planning ahead and really mapping out um, through mentorship, who could be a leader within your organization, I think um, really will help organizations um, thrive for the long, the long haul. Um, you know, I even want to take it a step further and kind of comment about um, how mentorship can be effective. Um, for, for example, um, teaching, you know, if you're like essentially scouting out for these young youth or younger leaders to be in your organization, teaching them how to be a leader, teaching them those social cues, um, how to act in office, how to um, just really function um, in, in the organization. And I, I think that's so essential, especially for those new graduates, because I, as we know, the academic realm and the professional realm are interdependent. However, they do not function the same at all. And so uh, once one graduate you know, get, gets the degree and then they enter into the workforce, they're having to learn and gain brand new skills that were never really touched on or talked about um, in their curriculum. So I think mentorship is a really great way to um, help guide that new graduate into the organization and be successful. Yeah. So Sarah, is, is mentorship as simple as just introducing two people? You know, is it, is it, um, you know, is it, is it that simple? You just say, Hey, here's, um, you know, this, uh, you know, more high, more experienced person who's been in our business and uh, get to know them. And there you go. Is there more to it? Definitely. Um, one of my favorite quotes is, you know, if you have come to help me, you're wasting your time. But if you came because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. So really, to me, that quote speaks about, you know, people don't mentor because they're required to. Um, it's really because people want to give back. It's a cyclical cycle. Um, you know, so I've been mentored in the past. Um, and so now I kind of want to turn around and help mentor, mentor others um, to be successful as well. Um, it's kind of that whole um, cyclical, what goes around comes around, but in a positive way, a positive spin. Yeah. So, I mean, so would you say what we're talking about right now is like mentorship mindset? Is this, Definitely. you know, kind of cool. Um, so why, why don't we kind of dive more into that? Uh, sure. Like, uh, I think, I think, I feel like this is probably a big, um, well, you know, this is mentorship that it, more than just a surface level, right? This is how to prepare for the mentorship process. So let's talk about the mentorship mindset. So one thing that I had noticed um, from, like I said, coming from the academic realm to going to the professional realm is in the academic realm, people want to share knowledge because knowledge is power. But in the professional realm, people hoard knowledge because they know that if they have knowledge, they'll be respected. And essentially it's, it's power. So I think to have a mentorship mindset means that you want to break that, um, break that uh, 
stereotype of wanting to hold on to knowledge you're you're actually doing the opposite you're wanting to spread knowledge share it with those amongst you to um you know include everyone i think it's really about inclusiveness um i think there's yeah i think there's if i can just dive in there so the you know there's a couple of feelings i think around the reasons why um people hoard knowledge right uh, I think, you know, you're, you're right. Knowledge is power. And I think a lot of times, um, w- at least from the people that I've talked to in the small businesses that, that we interact with, sometimes there's this feeling that like, if they share their knowledge, um, you know, then they don't have value at work anymore, right? Like they aren't as valuable because, um, you know, if they, if they document things or if they write things down, the business doesn't depend on them as much, right? Like they could hire someone else, someone cheaper, someone, you know, without as much uh, tenure at the business to be able to step in and kind of take over. Um, But I think like there's a whole big cultural like shift that starts from the top and, and, you know, uh, works its way down that um, you kind of have to have this like sharing is power or sharing is, you know, a, a critical value in your organization um, because that's when people feel comfortable sharing what they know. And I think like um, one of the, the key differences that I, I ended up um, in an earlier episode we talked, I talked with Keith Fuller on was this, um, when you share what you know or what you've developed about the business, it frees you up so that you can work on bigger, better things, right? Um, so it kind of ties in with this a little bit, you know, why do people hoard knowledge? Well, it can be for a variety of different reasons. Maybe it's an insecurity. Maybe it's, they feel more powerful, you know, or feel better about themselves, but how you break that is, you know, I think is, is an important part of like your cultural or the values, the core values that you have in your business. Um, which is what we talked about with Keith in an earlier episode. So if you're interested in that, you should check out the episode with Keith Fuller. Um, but it kind of ties hand in hand with this whole mentorship thing, I think. Yeah. And I think one way to break through that is through vulnerability. Um, and vulnerability can only really truly um, happen um, naturally when people feel psychologically safe in their workplaces, which means that they don't feel threaten that they're going to lose their job. They feel that, you know, they're wanted and they're valued and they're appreciated. So it's kind of meeting some of these very deep seated humanistic needs first in order for something like this to happen. So um, I think it is happening in some workplaces. It's just, um, this is not how things always were for every organization. So it's changing through time and it's changing through people wanting it to happen. Yeah, I love um, but to that. kind of get back to your point about, um, you know, many different reasons why hoarding knowledge happens, I think it's, you know, talking about not having alternative motives um, behind wanting to mentor someone. You know, it feels really good to give back and to share knowledge and to build a relationship with someone. I mean, serotonin, dopamine, oxytocin are all released in our brain when we're, when we give back, it feels good. And that kind of feeds back into that cyclical cycle of wanting to, of wanting to mentor somebody. Yeah. Um, So let's talk about some of the, the myths that exist about mentorship, Um, you know, and and let's kind of break these, break these apart. Um, So before uh, we started hit record today, we we kind of threw together a document um, uh, and we, we identified like five myths. And so Sarah, why don't we start talking about those? Um, sure. So um, one thing I really wanted to make sure that I communicated to those listening today were that, you know, mentorship looks different and it takes many forms. We don't have to put ourselves in these kind of box and make sure we check off all the to-dos to make sure that it it fits um, a certain particular mold or a certain idea of how we think things should be. Um, You know, I I think it takes many different forms. So along with that, um, it doesn't have to be official. It's not something that, you know, you agreed upon, you shake hands, you're like, hey, let's be mentors. Um, I think it is most effective actually when it happens organically and naturally and over time. Um, And the amount of information shared and the vulnerability increases um, 
through through the time that you spend with this person. Um, kind of kind of going off about time though, um, it's not it's not something that you feel that um, it has to be every so often um, or you know it has to be measured in some kind of way. Um, you you really don't know the impact that we have on others and that could be instrumental. Um, and carried with that person throughout the rest of their life. So there's no really way to measure it. So don't feel bogged down by feeling that you need to mentor this person once a week or once a month. Um, I mean, obviously you wanna continue to check, check on each other and you know, um, anyways, you get what I'm saying here. Yeah, no, no, that's, that's good. It, it, basically, you know, it doesn't, mentorship doesn't have to be official and it, it doesn't have to be on a schedule. Like it can, yep. you know, and probably the best, you know, knowledge bits and stuff that you'll share probably won't happen on purpose, right? Like it'll be that, um, you know, if, if 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 it could happen on purpose, like then you'd probably just build a curriculum that you'd throw everyone through, right? But that's the point of mentorship is it's the stuff that either you don't think of or doesn't happen all the time or just you can't put into words and into some learning management system. Like it has to just come from human interaction. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, in, in, in my experience, I've had mentors that were male, female, older, very close to my age. You know, um, it's, it's just really, there's no certain particular criteria like that you have to fit for it to be a mentor or have a mentorship. Um, so I can't stress that enough. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like, I've had really positive um, mentorship from younger people, even, you know, like people that, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, you just have to be, you have to be willing to, um, to learn, you know, and, and to, to and, and you have to recognize that you can learn stuff from anyone. And it, as soon as you start being, you know, like, well, I can't learn from them because they are X, Y, or Z you know, that's, you got to get out of that. That's, that's the opposite of mentorship mindset, right? Like yep. you're not in the right. Mindset. You need to be open-minded. Yeah. 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 Um, wow. and, and in order to like share that information, um, I, I think, um, at really what it's about at the heart of everything is that it's knowledge or wisdom sharing. Um, wisdom isn't just something that's reserved for older people. I mean, uh, we all have experiences and everyone has a point of view to bring to the workforce or the world and therefore it has value and should be heard and should be um shouldn't be knocked down right away just due to some kind of label that you want to put on yourself your gender or your age for example yeah that's cool um the the fifth one here the final one you know everyone has a different point of view and therefore adds uh, different value to the organization and relationships. And I think that kind of just ties into pretty much what we've been saying. Um, you know, it's, it, you really have to go into it with an open mind um, because everyone has a different vantage point um, and different experiences that they're drawing on, um, which you can benefit from as a men, um, uh, as someone who's being mentored. Mentee. Um, yeah, mentee. Um, the the other thing you know that I would just add here too is you don't have to like have. I think I personally think that mentorship can be a one way street. You know, it it doesn't um, like I've learned a lot from listening to podcasts of people that I uh, follow and and um, you know respect their experiences and all this kind of stuff. Now, of course, they don't know who I am, but I know who they are, and I listen listen to their advice and receive that mentorship from them, um, which is really like the power of all this technology that we have today. Like, um, you know, you can receive mentorship in very non-traditional ways as well. Um, some of which is more of a one-way street than, than a conversational mentorship session. All right, so let's talk about what mentorship looks like in uh, like today's workplaces. Sure. Um, so some of the things that I've um, acquired or became familiar with through people talking about it um, is micro mentoring. So basically, 
that's not like, like we were talking about before, it's not like a big, large, formal, uh, agreed, agreed upon uh, relationship. It's, it's smaller in these micro doses. Um, one way that I've seen organized do this, organizations do this, is through Slack. Um, and there's this little bot called Donut. And that will pair people together um, randomly each week and it encourages, encourages them to get to know one, one another over coffee. Um, it's a really interesting, I think, way to do it. Um, I think that it could be effective, but it really would only work, I, I truly believe, is if it's encouraged from top down, that it's built into the culture and that time is allocated or set aside for people to do this. Uh, one, way, one way organizations could um, really enforce this is to reimburse their coffee. So um, people go out um, or, you know, with, with coronavirus happening right now, you could still do it at home. Um, but yeah, when things kind of get back to normal, um, you know, go out, grab a donut or grab a coffee and um, put your receipt in your um, manager's inbox and, and get reimbursed for it. So it's kind of proof that you did it, but it's also um, maybe holding other coworkers accountable, seeing, you know, that you did do that. And um, it just kind of um, allows it to flourish um, due to being reinforced and yeah hey Sarah so is this something that you like currently do this um, like slack donut stuff is that yeah um, so I have exp I'm in a different slack group it's called um, culture community and um, I do <laughs> I do know that we've tried to do this um, unfortunately I have not partaked um, because it's not really more in a organization where you feel, um, well, uh, ultimately accountable to do it. Um, yeah. And I'm more so a believer in face-to-face. -face. However, my beliefs have kind of turned around a little bit about technology more recently with coronavirus. Um, I have had a lot through virtual means and um, so I do think it's possible. I just think we have to allow time in our own lives and allow time in organizations for this to actually happen. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Uh, and speaks to kind of your, your overarching point there of it has to be, um, you know, encouraged from the top down, which is, which is cool. Um, cool. So what else, you know, what other things are happening in the workplaces today? Um, you know, I've seen a little bit about job rotation. Um, so that's essentially someone learning different job uh, types within a, a allowed period of time. And during that time, it's very heavily focused on mentorship and sharing knowledge. Um, I, I believe um, and the, you had mentioned something about apprenticeship. Uh, apprenticeships are obviously a more traditional form of sharing that knowledge because it is very hands-on being in the trades. Um, but something that I came across in the research that I did was reverse mentoring or what I like to call mutual uh, mentoring. So I'm going to dive in a little bit about that. But yeah, basically, that's, that's awesome. um, re uh, reverse mentoring or mutual mentorship is, you know, an older employee providing a wing or a shelter to a newer employee. Uh, and giving that individual guidance throughout the organization um, to help them be successful. And in turn, the younger generation shares their um, expertise. Maybe it's technologically um, uh, oriented, um, but they share their knowledge with one another um, in the mentorship. Yeah, that that's awesome. Um, so what, um, so obviously I think like the, the, the biggest example that I've found with this reverse mentoring idea was with some large like Fortune 100 company um, was trying to adapt uh, like the internet or like tech, some kind of tech, you know, um, revolution, right? And, and so they paired their senior staff with, uh, you know, a more technology comfortable person who I think happened to be a younger, you know, person. Um, and, you know, basically the trade-off was the senior staff was training this younger generation on how to be a leader in the company. And the younger generation was showing the, um, you know, senior staff, this is how you use the computer, type emails, you know, and all, all of that, right? 
So that's like, I think, um, one of the most um, common examples of this reverse mentorship kind of um, uh, like practice, but it's much more than that, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, and it yeah. should be much more than that. And I, I truly do love that example, um, just because you, you can totally visual, visualize like that mentorship that's happening. However, um, you know, as we, re- as we evolve as a human species, um, you know, people are living longer and being in the workforce longer. Uh, we have to be careful that we don't reinforce stereotypes about people, um, especially in the tech industry. I know that's something that um, we're really kind of lagging behind. There's a lot of, um, let's be honest, sexism and ageism that's happening in the tech industry. So, you know, if we focus on these stereotypes, we're really missing the point of the mentorship, you know. Our whole, the whole goal of mentorship is to really challenge our preconceived notions um, about others and to be vulnerable vulnerable enough to learn something from someone or see something from someone else's um, perspective. And so that's kind of where, um, you know, that whole mutual mentorship comes in to replace reverse mentorship. Um, just the verbiage language shift can really help um, shift people's minds into how we view uh, modern mentorship. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, I love that. Um, it is mutual mentorship. Is that like a term that you've coined? Did you say, or did you find that? Um, I, that's actually from a, a man, um, who goes by the modern elder. You can go ahead and look him up. He's kind of the generational guru of the time that's been really talking about, um, you know, the generations in the workforce and how that lens is really essential to looking at, you know, some of the issues and how to progress together as um, a human race that that is working intricately together. So Modern Elder, he is, um, he's great. He's got some really good resources. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Um, So as we kind of wrap up our our conversation here today, um, you know, let's leave some um, final like tips, tricks, uh, about mentorship. Um, I think, um, what it really boils down to is making sure that it's the right match. Um, right. We need to have people with the right mindsets on both sides to be open enough and vulnerable enough, um, to want to form a mentorship. So mix it up, you know, have, uh, you know, obviously the traditional older, younger, but there's so many different variations and ways that mentorships can take place. So don't feel restricted by the normal, um, <laughs> those, I guess, mentorship stereotypes that we tend to fall into. Um, I think also another really important aspect is making a strong commitment to the relationship. You know, relationships um, are really essential or, uh, excuse me, are really, um, you know, they they do well when people make a commitment and it's more so a dialogue. Um, And so if you don't make a strong commitment, then the other person's going to feel like, they're, they're exposed and their vulnerability is out there. You know, they have their neck on the line a little bit. And if you're not willing to meet them where they're at, then um, they're just going to close back up and probably not want to pursue that relationship. So uh, essentially let go of that fear, lean into the discomfort. And I think people will be really surprised at the outcomes and the effects of this mentorship. And um, lastly, you know, <laughs> I can't stress this enough. Invest in your people. Um, Organizations, listen up. Invest in your people. They are your greatest asset. People over money uh, 100% of the time because people are making your money for you. So if you invest in people, you invest in mentorship, you're going to see that tenfold back in your organization. Yeah, uh, you know, take care of your people because they'll take care of your customers is, yeah, is uh, absolutely. something that I, I strongly believe in as well. Um, so, you know, lastly, you know, when is the, and, and this is pretty um, an obvious question, but like when is the best time, Sarah, to start thinking about succession planning and with that um, using mentorship for aiding in the succession planning process? Yeah. Um, I'm going to pull out another quote. I love quotes. I'm very inspired by them. (laughs) Um, So, you know, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. 
So jump in. Um, don't don't feel hesitant or you know um, feeling like you have to meet, meet certain metrics. Try it out. Come up with a plan. Talk to your um, talk to your employees. See if they're interested in starting something like this. Or if you're an employee, you know, put something together. Try it out. Um, you you really don't know what is gonna come of it. Um, but I can only speak on my experience and I'm so grateful. I've had so many different types of mentors in my life, um, short times, longer times, you name it. Like it's, um, it's been a blessing in my life and I'm really grateful for the people that have opened up and were willing to teach me and take me under their wing. And, and um, now, you know, I can share with them. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Um, so let's say someone needs a mentor on mentorship. How do people get a hold of you, Sarah? <laughs> Good question. You can find me on LinkedIn. Um, that's Sarah, S-A-R-A-H. Last name is Genki, G-I-E-N-C-K-E. Thanks so much for your time today, Sarah. Um, this has been awesome talking about mentorship, uh, the mentorship mindset and everything about it. Um, it's very clear that uh, you are passionate about it and that you have a lot of awesome insight. And uh, I, I hope people reach out if they have any questions or anything like that. Thanks for listening. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. Everyone have a great day.